Um, Leviticus chapter 11. We're going to do just two chapters this evening, um, and uh, we'll see what the Lord does. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much just for this evening, for giving us your word, for giving us Leviticus, Lord. Um, as, as many people often skip it or um, just you know, toss it out, um, Lord, there's so much wisdom in your word. Um, and so thank you for giving us uh, the opportunity to study it tonight. Thank you for giving us your spirit to teach us and guide us and convict us and encourage us, Lord. I pray that you would be honored and glorified, not just here, but especially once we leave this place, Lord. As some of us are going amongst um, unsaved friends and family, Lord, I, see, I pray they would see the hope that's within us, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Leviticus chapter 11, 11, starting in verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud, that you may eat. Nevertheless, these you shall not eat among those that chew the cud or the, those that have cloven hooves. The camel, because it chews the cud, but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The rock hyrax, or the rock badger, because it chews the cud, but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The hare, because it chews the cud, but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. And the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. Now we get to the part of Scripture where most people just can't get past. I mentioned earlier when it, when it comes to Leviticus, they have those um, yearly Bible reading apps. And, um, you know, sometimes you might get in a group with other, other friends and, you know, that way you can kind of check in. Hey, did you do your reading? Did you do your three chapters, five chapters, ten chapters, whatever your reading plan is? And, of course, they're tracking all of your data, which I guess tracking your Bible reading data isn't the worst thing they could track. Um, but in it, they've shown how once people get to Leviticus, Especially this section, the drop-off for the amount of users is just crazy. Because, you know, Genesis, that's great. We got creation, we got the flood, there's Nephilim, you know, are they giants, are they demons, who really knows? People are intrigued. You know, there's, there's the patriarchs. And then we get to Exodus and the ten plagues and the crossing of the Red Sea and a lot of the things happening at the beginning of the desert. And then we get to Leviticus. And Leviticus is, it starts out good. The first 10 chapters we've been going through, it's a pretty cool stuff. A lot, of, a lot of pictures that we could clearly see point to Jesus. But then we get to Leviticus 11, and it's like, all right, here's the menu. And it's mainly what's not on the menu. You know, do you guys have this? No. Do you guys have this? No. Do you guys have this? No. What do you have? You know, pot roast. Okay, well, I'm having pot roast, whether I like it or not. And the, and the reason people struggle with this section of Scripture is because it deals with so many ver various laws that don't implicitly apply to them. Right? In the New Testament, and even a lot of the Old Testament, like, say, the Ten Commandments, use that an ex as an example in Exodus 20. You know, the Ten Commandments says, do not steal. Well, I think all of us should understand that. And we can, we can read that law and we can understand how that can easily apply to our lives, you know. That, do, that doesn't just mean don't hold up a bank. That also means don't steal company time. Don't steal, don't take things that aren't yours. Don't, and it says don't covet. Don't commit adultery. All these things that we're like, you know what? I, I think I can see how that applies to my life. But then we get to don't eat these animals and we're talking about chewing the cud and, and cloven hooves and we're like, what in the world? Is this, is this an anatomy class, biology lesson? What's going on here? And yet, even though these laws don't implicitly apply to us today as believers under the new covenant, they're filled with so much wisdom and if we are paying attention, we'll see a lot of love from the Lord. This section, the Lord speaks about what kinds of animals that, that they can eat as his people. They have to be cloven animal, uh, animals with cloven hooves or split hooves. You know, the bottom of their feet, it's split in the middle. 
and they all mo- also have to chew the cud. I, 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 I'll be honest. I love that phrase. I don't know why, you know, I know what it means, but it just sounds so like, you know, ragtag, like a real man, you know, I'm chewing the cud, you know. It's just, it just sounds cool. Chewing the cud, that's just eating grass. You know, and, and I don't want to get too into it, but it's, it's the type, you know, the cows, they kind of eat the grass, they kind of regurgitate it a little bit, and they get the nutrients. Um, that's as far as I'll go. Um, I think chewing the cud kind of lays it out pretty well. But they had to have split hooves and they had to chew the cud. Well, and then, then he gives some examples here of, of what that doesn't include. We already know it does include goats, bulls, sheep, since they're referenced in the sacrifices prior to this. You wouldn't say, I want you to sacrifice these animals and partake of them. Oh, by the way, never mind, you can't eat them. No, we know that those ones were clean to the Israelites. But there's some that could not, that seem like they might qualify. It's almost like the Lord already knew that there was someone in the camp saying, what about rock badgers, you know? (laughs) And the Lord's like, yeah, you can't have a rock badger. Sorry, buddy. (laughs) No roasted rock badger. You know, it's interesting, um, as many of you know, I'm not from here, but I, I know a lot of locals, and uh, you talk to some of these locals around here, um, and uh, you'd be surprised what's on the menu at some of these people's houses. Raccoon, possum, muskrats, all sorts, squirrel, all sorts of things. Um, you know, I guess all, you know, we can look at Acts chapter 10 and the blanket. I don't know if raccoon and possum were on that blanket where the Lord's telling Peter to eat. Um, but you know, hey, it, it, grace, I guess. But there's always someone, right? The rock badger. I, that's the one that sticks out to me the most. The rock badger. Um, the rabbit. Um, the camel. All of these things that they were unclean. No pigs. No pork. No swine. Now, you could read this and say, well, that's just random. Why is the Lord forbidding? I mean, even in our own culture nowadays, we're looking at this, and probably the one that sticks out to us the most is is swine. I mean, what's the South known for? Barbecue pig, barbecue pork. I just had some bar. I had brisket, so I guess that's, you know, it's technically kosher, and we're good to go on that. But um, I was looking at the barbecue pork yesterday. Um, it's hard to pass up some good barbecue pork. But um, we're, we're sitting here wondering, well, why didn't he want them to have it, you know? Even rabbit, that's something you can find on a lot of menus nowadays. But this was mostly due to the health of the animals mentioned. In today's day, we can eat things like camel, pig, or even hares because of the food prep safety standards that we have. They did not have things like that back then. <laughs> And so to protect the people from various sicknesses and disease, he forbade them from eating these animals. In fact, again, as we'll get through Leviticus, you'll find a lot of weird laws that you're like, well, why, you know, why does God have to tell them that? Or, or why is God putting this in scripture? You know, it's, it's right next to don't bow down to idols is, you know, make sure that when you go to the bathroom, you cover it up. It, it's because it's the same heart of the Lord to protect his people. And this is just something to keep in mind as we continue on in this book especially and get through these various laws is that he wasn't forbidding them to have, you know, hey, I know how good barbecue pork is and that's, you guys can't eat that. He was saying, look, it's, it's not something that right now you guys should eat because you guys can get really sick from it. In fact, up until really most modern times, you know, swine that was eaten was kind of given to most of the poor people and they got really sick from it. And so continuing on, he's in verse nine, he's gonna give us some lists of some more animals they can and can't eat. And again, we're gonna sit here and scratch our heads saying, well, who, who's raising their hands asking about these animals? But there's always that one in the group. These you may eat, verse 9, of all that are in the water, whatever in the water has fins and scales, whether in the sea or in the rivers, that you may eat. But all in the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins or scales, all that move in the water or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. 
They shall be an abomination to you. You shall not eat their flesh, but you shall regard their carcasses as an abomination. Whatever in the water does not have fins or scales, that shall be an abomination to you. And these you shall regard as an abomination among the birds. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the kite, and the falcon after its kind. Every raven after its kind. The ostrich, the short-eared owl the seagull, and the hawk after its kind, the little owl, the fisher owl, and the screech owl, the white owl, the jackdaw, and the carrion vulture, the stork, the heron after its kind, and the hoopoe, and the bat. Recently we found out bats aren't good, good to eat. Um, it'll shut down the whole world apparently. All flying insects that creep on all fours shall be an abomination to you. Yet these you may eat of every flying insect that creeps on all fours. Those which have jointed legs above their feet with which to leap on the earth. These, these you may eat. The locust after its kind. The destroying locust after its kind. The cricket after its kind. And the grasshopper after its kind. But all other flying insects which have four feet shall be an abomination to you. Now, the first part is the seafood menu. And on this menu, oysters will not be eaten in any month of the year, despite, you know, might have an R in it or not. Which, again, I, I read some of these and I'm like, Lord, I'm thankful for Acts chapter 10 and I'm thankful for grace because I love raw oysters. <laughs> love them. And I know, yeah, I know that's an acquired taste, but thankful the Lord for his grace um, not just to save me but hey I get to eat oysters too but again we can see the Lord's wisdom in protecting his people from things that can harm them right I mean again the fact that today we're able to eat a lot of these things last night uh, I went out and got sushi you know and I know still that's an acquired taste for some but I could trust knowing that hey because of the food safety standards I can eat this raw fish and I'll be okay yeah, hopefully. <laughs> it's, it is a gamble, but, um, I, but you know, you, you, you trust the, I guess you trust the system, maybe. But he does all this to protect us. And I think that's important to understand when we read the law. The law was not written for us to just check boxes off, but the law was written to protect us to keep us from the consequences of sin, to keep us from the consequences of these actions that the Lord is forbading. It was not for his sake that the law was written, but for our own sake, to keep us, to protect us. And again, when you read the law, even when you get into the New Testament, you have some of those things that the Lord is, and through the apostles are, are forbidding, right? It's to protect the people. It's not just because the Lord doesn't want you to have a good time. It's to protect you. The last section that we read here is about birds and insects. And again, it gets a little weird. And, and um, most of the birds that he forbids, you'll notice, are predatory birds or they're scavenger birds. So they're birds that eat other animals and you don't know what kind of diseases those animals have. And so... He says, well, I, you know, you never know what that falcon just ate and that might have a disease, which if you eat the falcon, that'd give you a disease. Again, he's protecting you. Seagulls, vultures, buzzards, ravens, scavengers, right? Especially those seagulls, man. You always see, we, uh, we play, uh, go to Lake Mayor Park and, you, you, and there's just people just feeding these, these seagulls and, and these geese and stuff. And I mean, those, those things will eat anything. It's own rocks, they'll try and eat it. I've never tried but I know it could be done. But they're just scavengers, and the Lord's like, don't eat those. That's, that's gross. That's nasty. You don't know what kind of diseases they might have, what kind of diseases they might give you. And then the insects, that's probably the one that we all can agree on. <laughs> that's one that we don't even need qualifiers for. You know? No one's asking, well, what about these insects? You know, <laughs> most of us, at least in our culture, you go to other cultures though, man, insects are a big source of protein. And there's some insects you can eat and some insects you can't. And why? Well, those insects will kill you <laughs> if you eat them. Those insects won't. 
And what's crazy is when you read that list, um, really it's, it's mainly grasshoppers and locusts, which even to today's standards, those are really the mainly the main insects eaten across the world, grasshoppers and locusts. And there's other ones that people try and whatnot, but um, that's a main source of, of diet for a, a lot of cultures. Or maybe not a main source, but a big source. Later on in the Bible, the, there will actually be men of God that eat these insects, live off these insects. Seems weird, but hey, they were following the law. Well, continuing on in verse 24, by these you shall become unclean. Whoever touches the carcass of any of them shall be unclean until evening. Whoever carries part of the carcass of any of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. The carcass of any animal which divides the foot but is not cloven hoofed or does not chew the cud is unclean to you. Everyone who touches it shall be unclean. Now this next section is all about touching the carcass of a dead animal. And I want you to pay attention to the fact that the animals that they can touch a dead carcass are the ones that they can sacrifice to the Lord. It be kind of hard to put a dead animal on, a, on the altar and then, oh man, I'm unclean, you know. The Lord says, no, if you're going to be sacrificed to me to these clean animals, I'm going to give you the ability to do that. You won't be unclean if you're sacrificing the right kinds of animals, the clean animals. It's just one thing to take note of, you know, that the Lord makes a way for, him, for you to still honor him and worship him and give to him. Verse 27, and whatever goes on its paws among all kinds of animals that go on all fours, those are unclean to you. Whoever touches any such carcass shall be unclean until evening. Whoever carries any such carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. It is unclean to you. These also shall be unclean to you among the creeping things that creep on the earth, the mole, the mouse, and the large lizard after its kind, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the sand reptile, the sand lizard, and the chameleon. These are unclean to you among all that creep. Whoever touches them when they are dead shall be unclean until evening. Anything on which any of them falls when they are dead shall be unclean, whether it is any item of wood or clothing or skin or sack, whatever item it is in which any work is done, it must be put in water. And it shall be unclean until evening, then it shall be clean. Any earthen vessel into which any of them falls, you shall break, and whatever is in it shall be unclean. In such a vessel, vessel any edible food upon which water falls becomes unclean, and any drink that may be drunk from it becomes unclean. And everything on which a part of any such carcass falls shall be unclean, whether it is in an oven or cooking stove, it shall be broken down, for they are unclean and shall be unclean to you. Nevertheless, a spring or a cistern in which there is plenty of water shall be clean. But whatever touches any such carcass becomes unclean. And if a part of any such carcass falls on any planting seed which is to be sown, it remains clean. But if water is put on the seed, and if a part of any such carcass falls on it, it becomes unclean to you. Now, if you took biology in high school and, and you understand you know, any, any sort of um, plant anatomy or any things like that, He's saying, look, if, if it's a dry seed and a, and a dead animal falls on it, it's not going to do anything to the seed. But if you've planted it in the ground, you've watered it, and, and it starts to grow, the fruit starts to bear, and then a dead animal falls on it, well, then it's unclean. Why? Well, because in that process, those diseases or whatever from that dead animal could get into that stuff. When it's just a dry seed, well, you know, it doesn't really matter what falls on it or touches it. We can also see that the Lord makes difference between if you have a pot full of water and a dead animal falls in it, well, get rid of that pot and that water. That's unclean. Don't drink it. But a spring or a cistern, now that's different, a spring or a cistern, something that's constantly flowing, something that's constantly bringing up water, that's renewing and refreshing itself. It's a great picture here of a spiritual life. Someone who's just sitting there dead when they're touched by death, they're sitting there stagnant and stale and they're touched by death, well, guess what? It's gonna affect them a lot. 
they're going to more easily fall into sin. And by death, I'm speaking of not just a dead animal. I'm speaking of sin. I'm speaking of the flesh. I'm speaking of the world. We have this really great picture of what can happen to us when we hang around death too much in Psalm chapter one. It talks about the man who doesn't walk amongst the sinners or stand amongst the scornful or sit, finally sitting, taking part, taking place, having fellowship with those that are in sin. But see, if you have a ever-flowing water that's refreshing itself, renewing itself, even when death hits it, boom, it's clean. For those of us as believers, if we're constantly being washed by the word, if we're constantly being filled with the spirit, even when the things of this world come at us, it's not gonna affect us that if, if we're just stale water. If you're just stagnant, stale, and death falls upon you, well, guess what? It's to be thrown out. But if you're a spring of living water, even death can't do anything to you. I think that's a great picture of for us in Christ. And a great reminder that we're to constantly be filled with the Spirit. Right? Paul says in Ephesians, do not be drunk on wine, rather be filled with the Spirit. And that word that he used to be filled, it's a present active, which means really it should be translated constantly be filled, being filled. Not just be filled once and you're good to go. I've shared this about um, D.L. Moody. He would always pray before, but he would always pray that um, the Lord would fill him with the Spirit. And finally, one of the, the older ladies at the church went up to him and just kind of confused that her pastor was always asking to be filled with the Spirit. You know, well, didn't he get filled with the Spirit when you were called? And isn't that good enough till you're, till you're dead for the rest of your ministry? And she goes, well, well, Pastor, why do you always ask to be filled with the Spirit? And he says, well, it's simple, I leak. <laughs> and that's what the picture Paul paints in Ephesians, to constantly be filled with the Spirit so that even when death hits us, when sin is, a, we're surrounded by sin, we're surrounded by the flesh, we're surrounded by the enemy, well, we won't be unclean. But when we're stagnant, when we're just stale in our walk with the Lord, that's when it only takes a little bit. The devil doesn't have to push us too hard to sin when we're stagnant. In fact, we're usually looking for it, right? James even says, let none of you say that you're tempted by God, but we're all led away by our own flesh, by our own desires, if our flesh is left to itself and is not constantly being washed away, well then it starts, it starts looking. It starts living. We start living according to the flesh. Verse 41, And every creeping thing that creeps on the earth shall be an abomination. It shall not be eaten. Whatever crawls on its belly, whatever goes on all fours, or whatever has many feet among all creeping things that creep on the earth, these you shall not eat, for they are an abomination. So, you know, spiders, centipedes, they're an abomination. You know, I think we all can, again, get, get with that. You shall not make for yourselves, verse 43, abominable with any creeping thing that creeps, nor shall you make yourselves unclean with them, lest you be defiled by them. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourself, set yourselves apart, be holy. And you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law of the animals and the birds and of every living creature that moves in the waters and of every creature that creeps on the earth to distinguish between the unclean and the clean, between the animal that may be eaten and the animal that may not be eaten. 
What we can see from here is that death can defile you. They're not to touch these carcasses. In fact, we saw a little bit earlier when Moses is speaking to the priests that you know, if someone dies, that the priests aren't supposed to touch the body unless it's a really close family member. Then they could be a part of that. But death defiles, and what God has pointed to them is that, A, death is not something that he's created. He's telling them to stay away from death, to not be near death, especially of these unclean things. Another thing he's pointing out is there is a mark of distinction. There is clean and there is unclean. Notice there's no middle ground. There's no, well, you know, on Wednesdays we have fish. (laughs) It's clean or unclean. It's saved or unsaved. It's of the world or it's of Christ. You're either for me or you're against me. There is no middle ground when it comes to the Lord. There's clean or unclean. And this is something throughout the whole Bible. And there's many who have tried to kind of teeter that line. Well, uh, you know, I'm not, not, I'm not clean, but you know, I'm not unclean. Or I'm kind of clean, or some days I'm clean, some days I'm unclean. You know, I like to get a little down and dirty sometimes. Sometimes I like to look my best. One of the main things that the Bible speaks of on this, these two ends of the spectrum is you're either dead or you're alive. The New Testament is very heavy on that. The New Testament speaks about how we were, before we were with Christ, we were dead in our trespasses and sins and now we have been brought to life. I want to turn to a section real quick, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You can turn with me there, or you can listen along. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul has a section here where he speaks about being defiled by the flesh, to be set apart, to be consecrated. Notice back there in Leviticus 11, Twice towards the end there, the Lord says, you shall be holy for I am holy. Because we are his people. We're following after him. He goes, I'm holy, well, so you guys should be holy as well. Starting in verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 6, he says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial, or the devil? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Notice this. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And Paul quotes from the Old Testament there, do not touch what is unclean. So again, Leviticus 11, people read it, they're like, well, it has nothing to do with me. Well, then it must not have anything to do with 2 Corinthians. But that's not the case. It has everything to do with us. To not touch what is unclean. In another section, Paul talks to the church and he talks about how we should be innocent when it comes to the things of the world. We should be ashamed to know of the things that they do in the dark. You know, and, and when I was a, a younger believer, I certainly thought, well, you know, like, so I can reach the world, I need to, be, I need to know what they're doing, how they're speaking, what they're watching. 
You know, I want to be able to hold a conversation with my coworkers about the latest TV show or latest movie. So I've got to watch it so I can kind of, you know, relate to them. And then who knows, maybe I can show how that lead character is actually a picture of Christ and then I can present the gospel. Not gonna work. Don't touch what is unclean. Those things that defile us. I've shared this story a few times, but I remember um, my first semester of Bible college. I, I was coming from a pretty bad place in my life going into that time, um, you know, ran away from the Lord, trying to do my own thing, and, and I loved music. I still love music, but I loved music, and I loved all music, and I mean, all the stuff you'd never want your son to hear. And I knew all the words, and I loved repeating those words. And I used to tell myself all the time, because I, I, I did it even when I was younger, and thought, ah, oh, I'd get away with it. It's not affecting me. I like it for the art. I like it for the beat. I like it, you know, for the cultural relevance of it. And as I look back, I realize how that stuff was defiling me. But I remember that first semester of Bible college, the Lord just told me I had a library of music. And the Lord said, just get rid of it. I was like, I don't know. Some of this stuff you can't even get anymore, you know. It's collector's edition, whatever it was. And I just remember the Lord telling me, this is stuff is defiling you. You could see it in your speech. I could, he- I could see it in my thoughts. I had it in my dreams. These things defiling me, touching things that were unclean, making me unclean. And the more that I've walked with the Lord, the more I've realized that there's things in my life that I've had to cut out, not because, you know, oh, that's bad, because and, 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 even Paul, Paul will talk about in Romans, he says, you know, it's okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Why? Well, because idols are nothing. They don't exist. They're just wood or stone. There's nothing behind them. There's a demonic presence, but, you know, there's not an actual God you're worshiping. It's just beef. But there are certain things that defile us and make us unclean. And, and the Lord's telling the children of Israel here, don't do those things. And another thing was in, those, in this time, many of these animals that were eaten, some of the ones that they even talked about here, referenced here that they're not to eat, were used in religious practices by some of the surrounding nations. Or they were worshipped in a way by these other nations. And again, the Lord's saying, you need to be separate That's what he says there in Leviticus 11 and verse 44. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves. That means set yourselves apart for me. You need to be separate from the world. Not trying to fit in with the world. Listening to what they do. Watching what they do. Talking like they do. But consecrate yourselves to me. Do not touch what is unclean. Well, chapter 12, it's a, a short chapter. Um, and again, we're, we're going to get into a lot of just like it. We're talking about animals, boom. Now we're talking about childbirth. <laughs> I mean, the themes are changing constantly. But again, we'll see what the Lord's doing here. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, if a, mo- if a woman has conceived and born a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days, as in the days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. She shall then continue in the blood of her purification 33 days. She shall not touch any hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purification are fulfilled. But if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her customary impurity, and she shall continue in the blood of her purification 66 days. So we see it's double with the girls. When the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether for a son or a daughter, she shall bring to the priest a lamb of the first year as a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove as a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. 
and she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who has been born a male or a female. And if she is not able to bring a lamb, then she may bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, one as a burnt offering and the other as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for her and she will be clean. Now that last verse is, is really interesting if you look at Luke chapter two. Luke chapter two, the story of Jesus' birth and we're told that after eight days, his parents did as the law said, took him to the priest, he got circumcised and what did they offer? Two turtle doves. It shows that Joseph and Mary certainly weren't well off, but we see, look, the Lord already making provision for those who can't afford it. We talked about this earlier, that atonement, you can't be, it can't be bought. Atonement wasn't just for the rich. The Lord made it so that everyone had an opportunity to make atonement for their sins. You know, if you were rich, well, then you had to, you had to offer a bull. If you, you, know, you were kind of middle class, you could offer two turtle doves. And he says for even those who couldn't even afford that, they could just offer fine flour. But they did have to offer something. But it wasn't a pay-to-play scheme. <laughs> but we have here, I just wanted to point out that last verse, but we have in this whole section, the law for women after childbirth. And as we can see, there is a difference between having a male and a female child. And, and as the Bible, men- as it's mentioned in verse 7, this is the law for he who has born a male or a female. The verse ends there. There's no other things, and we have to mention in our day and age, it's male or female, and it's at birth. There's no later on, there's no, well, we'll let the child decide. From scriptures, it's male or female. Right? We see a lot, saw that in Genesis, but we see it didn't change when sin entered the world. When sin entered the world, God says, yeah, it's still male and female, just, just so we get that right. For a male, they had to be circumcised on the eighth day, which we, we just looked at this past Sunday, that outward representation that they were God's people. That was how they identified as being God's people. They were circumcised. And they were circumcised at a young age. There were, um, there were some cultures in that day that did practice circumcision, but it was usually later on in life. But from the very beginning, God's consecrating them. These are my people that outward expression of being the Lord's people. And then, as we saw on Sunday, for us, it's no longer that physical, fleshly mode, but it's the Spirit living inside of us, achieving His work in us and through us that is clearly evident. The Spirit bears fruit in our lives, and that's what shows that we are children of God. Jesus says, if you abide in me, you will, not you might, not you could, not you should, but you will bear fruit. It is impossible to abide in Christ and be unfruitful. Well, you know, I'm just, I'm going through a season of unfruitfulness. If you're abiding in Christ, that's impossible. Because if you're saying that, you're calling Jesus a liar. That is our outward expression. That we're God's people. And we see that the the woman had to make atonement for her and um, to make herself clean. Throughout this whole section, I think from the childbirth even to talking about the, the menu, as I call it, the Levitical menu, it's more of, again, what we don't have um, than what we do have. Um, we can just see that the Lord is providing for his people. He cares for his people. The law is not made to keep you from anything except harm. In fact, Paul in the New Testament calls the law good. The law good. Jesus, when he was on this earth, he goes, I didn't come to abolish the law. You know, there's some that they they call themselves red letter Christians or New Testament only because they say, well, we don't need any of those other books. Wow, I just turned right to the New Testament. That's pretty cool. We don't need any of these other books. 
Because oh, we have the new covenant, the new testament. We don't need all those laws. They don't apply to us. Yes, we don't have to follow them or keep them because Christ has done that on our behalf. But there's still great wisdom to be found in these laws. Great wisdom. As we're going to see a little bit later, um, Moses is going to talk about what to do when you find mold in your house. There's a lot of wisdom in that, especially living in, in a swampy area like Savannah. What do you do when you find mold? Well, you get rid of it. You remediate it. It'd be a smart business. Moses' mold removal. Or I, I guess it'd be Aaron because it was the, the priest that went in and did it. Priestly mold, mold removal. But we can see throughout this stuff, even though we were like, what are we talking about? Childbirth? I didn't have to offer a bull for my kid. You know, I didn't have to do this or do that. You, one thing that's, that's interesting that I was, uh, I've read up on before is, I'm certainly not an expert in it. I'll let the experts be the experts. I'll just read what they say. Is when it comes to circumcision, even in today's day and age, 6,000 years later, they still tell you when you have a boy to get him circumcised on the eighth day. Well, they found, done all these studies, that, that the reason the eighth day is the best day is because it has to do with them building their immunity and their susceptibility to different diseases, um, how fast the blood flows. Um, again, I'm not an expert, so don't, don't come out, you know, when should I, I don't know. Like, you know, I'm not gonna look at the bump on your back or anything. <laughs> But they found that the eighth day is the best day for children to be circumcised on, boys to be circumcised on. Who'd have thunk it? God did. <laughs> God did 6,000 years ago when he said on the eighth day. He wasn't just saying, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, that sounds good. On the eighth day to be circumcised. God designed us. God knows us. That's why he gives us his, his laws and his commands for us, not for him. He's not up there saying, well, I'm glad you did that. Good job. He's saying, I did that. Just like we tell our kids, don't play in the street. Why? But it's more fun in the street. Yeah, it's also more dangerous in the street. Don't go pet that. We, just, just tonight, we uh, had these cats, um, feral cats hanging out our, in front of our house making weird noises and all the kids wanted to touch them and I said no why because well, I don't know what the cat has I hope the cat's okay but you know don't just go up to feral cats and start touching them because the Lord loves us the Lord knows us and the Lord's going to protect us well this Thanksgiving after I don't know about you I'm hungry after reading about what we can't eat, and then I'm thinking of a couple days from now, like what we're eating. You know, most of us are going to eat turkey. Um, yeah, turkey's not explicitly mentioned here, so I think we're safe. I think we're good. I know some people, they don't have turkey. They like to do things differently, so um, you're more than welcome to have swine, um, barbecue pig, whatever you want to do. Um, you know, oysters on the half shell, whatever you'd like, because uh, now we're under the new covenant, right? Acts chapter 10. Peter's there, he's on the porch, and he has a vision. The Lord visits him in a vision. He has a sheet laid out before him, and he said, rise, Peter, you know, take and eat. And Peter's like, none of this I can eat as a good Jewish guy. And he goes, no, what I've called clean, you better not call unclean. And I know that he's pointing that to the Gentiles, um, but it was from that point on that the church started you know, saying, hey, you know, I, guess we, I guess we can eat these things. We don't have to be afraid anymore. The Lord's still looking after us, just like he was then. He's looking after us today. And so listen to him. Listen to what he's telling you. If he's telling you no on that thing, it's not because he doesn't want you to have fun. It's because he's protecting you. You're his child, and he loves you, and he cares for you, and he knows you better than you do. Lord, we thank you so much just for you knowing us. And so, Lord, as you know us better than anyone else can, Lord, give us what we need this, this evening and this week. Lord, we're so thankful for all that you do and all that you've done and all that you're going to do, Lord. I pray that you would use us mightily here in Savannah or wherever you might have us this next week. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.